The Puritan pastor, Richard Baxter, wrote the following. Ever keep thy soul possessed with believing thoughts of the infinite love of God. Love is the attractive of love. Few so vile, but will love those that love them. No doubt it is the death of our heavenly life to have hard thoughts of God. To conceive of him as one that would rather damn than save us. When our ignorance and unbelief have drawn the most deformed picture of God in our imaginations, then, then we complain that we cannot love him nor delight in him. This is the case of many thousand Christians. Hard thoughts of God. Hard thoughts of God is where we left Naomi, where you leave Naomi at the end of chapter 1. Chapter 1 focuses on Naomi's experience of extraordinary love from her daughter-in-law, Ruth. Ruth is an instrument, really, of God's love towards Naomi. And in chapter 2 of Ruth, the focus on Ruth switches slightly from her as instrument of love to her as the recipient. She is now uh, in question. What will happen to this this brave young woman who has cast herself on the mercy of God, of Yahweh, have transferred allegiance to God's country, to God's people, has committed herself to his care. The ch chapter 2 really answers the question, wh what's going to happen to Ruth? And it speaks to us, I think, in our potential, our tendency to have hard thoughts of God. Sometimes hard thoughts of God are like a spike of bitterness, anger towards God. That seemed to be the case some level with Naomi. Sometimes it's, it's more like an iceberg of self-confidence. Sometimes it's just like the rocky ground of spiritual neglect. We have hard thoughts of God simply because we haven't sown affection towards God or love towards God. Hard thoughts come in all shapes and sizes. Sometimes they're aloof. Sometimes they're active. Sometimes they're just forgotten thoughts of God. But whatever our hard thoughts of God, Ruth chapter 2 intends to change them. Whatever my deformed picture of God in my imagination might be, Ruth chapter 2 intends to transform that perspective. So let's bring our hard thoughts, whatever form they may take, to Ruth chapter 2. And let's read it together. Verse 1. Now, Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who is in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning until now except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but 
keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why? Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord. For you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain. And she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean, even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also, pull out some from the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, you shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests, and she lived with her mother-in-law. <clears throat> extraordinary. That's an extraordinary story. Extraordinary. One thing we have to do to understand, to enjoy, and to benefit from especially Old Testament true stories, narratives like this, is we, we have to avoid a couple of different dangers. Uh, one danger is to jump so quickly to its relevance to us and to try to think, okay, what's the theology here? What does this mean for me today? That we, we, we lose some of the human element of the story and, and we make it sort of this cold, hard theology truth that we don't feel the warmth, the richness, the power of understanding the human side. We've, we've got to feel Ruth's experience at a human level. That's the way stories work. They communicate theology through the human experience of the story. This is not just a biography. It's not just some random newspaper clipping, interesting events in Bethlehem. Um, it has a theology it's intending to push to us, okay? It has a point.
but we're only going to get that point if we feel the human story first. So the human story comes first, but the other danger is that we stay there and we think of it as just factual. And the most we're supposed to get out of it is uh, the ability to answer a Bible's test or something. Yes, I know Ruth. I know who she is. That happened and move on. No, no, th this has personal relevance for us. God intends this to teach us about himself and about our lives and about our relationship to him. So we we've got to do both. So on the human element, let let's just feel uh, the reality of what's going on here. I'm, I'm going to break up this passage into three, three sections. Her journey her surprise, and her story. Okay, her journey, her surprise, and her story. I think you can kind of see those sections as we walk through this. Let's, let's talk about her journey. Ruth has come to this moment. She's committed herself. She's intertwined herself with Naomi. She decided that Naomi's future was going to be Ruth's future. She's entrusted herself to Yahweh, the God of Israel. But other than that, the future looks bleak. Uh, in that culture, two women living alone would have been incredibly vulnerable. They apparently have no holdings to support themselves. We have no sense that they have some savings. We, we just have the sense that they desperately need food. They, they have to survive. And, and it's difficult in our culture uh, to feel the desperation of that, isn't it? Isn't that hard? I mean, we, we, we get concerned when there's not a certain type of food in our refrigerator and wow we might have to drive five minutes um, to a store and oh this is concerning there's nothing here uh, that's our definition of, of, of desperation normally um, uh, this is not the case here they're, they're looking at, at emptiness and no store nearby to gain food no way of surviving. This, this is a life and death kind of situation. That's why they went to Moab in the first place. Because th there, was no, there was no food just lying around. There was no canned backup. There was no food in the land. Now there's food in the land, but they have no means of getting it. We, we've got to feel the neediness here. Naomi is dependent on Ruth, younger and stronger. But Ruth has a need and so she starts this journey. She says to Naomi, let me go in, into the field and I'll glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. Here's the idea here. The reapers are reaping the field and the laws of Israel allowed those that were very poor, very needy to trail along behind them and hope that they would drop something that you could eat. Let's think how quickly you're going to get enough food by hoping the reapers who are being paid to reap well are going to drop enough for you to eat, that the other poor among the land are not going to snatch it up first. It was supposed to be the case that the corners of the fields were going to be left for poor people, but who knows if you'll be there soon enough or near enough. That's your meal. Hoping that the leftovers, the forgotten elements, the corners of a field might be enough for you to beat out a meager existence, subsistence for you and Naomi. That's, that's her hope. And she recognizes also, probably because she's a foreigner and not likely to get first in line, that she's going to need some favor. Somebody is going to have to show her favor or this is not going to work. So she starts this journey, makes her way outside of Bethlehem, and she's just wandering through fields where harvest is taking place. She makes her way to a particular field, and I want to zero in on a, a crucial word that by its very smallness could be passed over, and I think that's exactly the point. Go down there to verse 3. It says, she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field that belongs to Boaz, the man introduced to us earlier as the relative of Elimelech, the near relative in the clan of Naomi's husband. She happens, actually that phrase could be translated, she chanced to chance upon the field. It's as though the writer has this massive ironic wink in over speaking that phrase. 
and gleaning through the fields, she chanced to chance upon the field of the man who was a relative of her, of all the fields in the world. She had to walk into his. I mean, that's kind of like what the, what the writer is saying. She chanced to chance upon. It's the way the story of Ruth is written. The story of Ruth has God's love as its hero. Absolutely, that is the hero in Ruth. It's the covenant love of God. But that covenant love is concealed in Ruth, in apparent coincidences and in the actions of people. It's concealed. God doesn't show up in his Shekinah glory and speak from a mountain or rain down manna. No, he happens to be there ensuring that she happens to be where Boaz will be and in his field. Her journey invites us to see the sovereign, generous love of God directing her where he needs her. That's what this writer is getting to. There's a wonderful, worthy man named Boaz who happens to be related to this dead man and her needy widow and daughter-in-law. He's right there. There's a desperately needy Moabite who would likely face ostracism because of her ethnicity. She makes her way to fields in Bethlehem and happens to come in proximity to that very man. And then the surprises keep coming in the journey. It says, you notice in verse 4, Behold! Now, there's not really a need for behold there unless he's making a theology point. Behold, not only is she in the field, she's in the field in time for Boaz to come from Bethlehem and see her. Here's the point of this opening part of this story. Ruth might wonder where her favor is going to come from, but God's generous love has already worked it all out. Her journey is being directed. It's being guided by a sovereign hand. No chance about this occasion at all. Behold, behold the impossible. Behold the inconceivable. Behold what has now taken place. Boaz sees Ruth. Behold, the writer says. And he invites us to see someone at work. Behold. I had a friend that um, wanted to go on a, a church plant to Denver. I, this was a long 20 years ago now. He wanted to go on this church plant, but he didn't have any job. He had no job. He wanted to go, but no job. And so he decided to fly to Denver and just look for a job. Uh, just, he was going to just, in faith, I guess, fly out there and just, he was kind of a handy person. He thought maybe he could find a job. So he just flew. He went to the airport, and the Denver airport is basically in Kansas. Um, it's not close to Denver. Don't ask me why they put it there, but it's not close. So he, he didn't have a ride from the Denver airport. So it's something like, I don't know, 25 miles. Uh, he didn't have a ride to the city. So he just started walking, this, this guy. But he's really wanted to plant this church, and so he needed a job. So he just started walking from the airport. He's walking from the airport. Well, somebody picks him up on the side of the road. Now, I'm not recommending this, okay? <laughs> this is not a recommendation to young people to hitchhike their way anywhere. But a guy picked him up. Well, as they're talking, the guy decides to offer him a job. He needs this paint work this guy was doing, I guess. So he offers him a job. The guy that happens to pick him up on the way, he's hitchhiking his way from the Denver airport across the state to the city of Denver where he wants to plant a church, and this guy picks him up and offers him a job. So he has a job, and they moved, and they're part of the church. Why was that guy there? God put him there. Is there any other explanation? Sometimes when we think about our life and the practical events of our life, we, we question the organizational ability of God. Really, God? Traffic today. Really? Really, God? I mean, really? We had to have an argument right before small group? Really, God? Really, my children had to be difficult this morning? My sister's getting married. Bad morning for my children to be difficult. Really, my son-in-law had to move that far away? Really, God? We question the directional ability of God. This story screams 
don't question God's ability to give good directions. He knows exactly where he's taking you. You might not know, walking through the fields that day, what he has in store at the end, but he does. Her story, her journey, moving on, her surprise, her surprise. Boaz investigates, finds out that this is indeed the Moabite woman. Undoubtedly, there was some talk of her in the town of Bethlehem, who has come back, it says in verse 6, with Naomi from the country of Moab, and he communicates, she has asked to glean and gather among the sheaves. Now, I think uh, the, the young man here is left somewhat ambiguous. Uh, he says she has gleaned. He, he doesn't make it explicit that he gave her permission. I think he's kind of, this is like job protection here. She asked and she's continued to do it. He doesn't say I gave her permission. He just says she's continued to glean, you know. So whatever happens, I'm kind of protecting myself slightly here. But then we have this gap. And if, if your Bible is like mine, they, they created a little paragraph here. Uh, that's probably not in the original text, but it's, it's actually interesting because between verse 7 and verse 8, there is this incredible pause. It's like the pause before the downpour. I want you to feel this pause. Feel that pause. She's been on this, this journey. God has led it, but we don't know what the end's going to be. We don't know the end. Verse 7, we still don't really know. What's Boaz going to say? Why did you let her stay? She's a Moabite. We, we can't allow Moabite women uh, to be here. There's a dangerous history in Israel with Moabite women. Uh, you know what? This is unwise. Let's let her test her gleaning in some other field. Uh, that's fine. She can glean in the field. No problem. Just keep an eye on her. Oh, wonderful. Good job. Way to let her glean. Just very helpful. We want to be good law-abiding citizens. Make sure she gets, you know, don't, don't, don't keep her from gleaning the leftovers. That's what, Any one of those responses would have been understandable. The last one would have been legitimate law-keeping. What's he going to say? That's the feeling. We, we need to feel that. What's he going to say? And then the downpour begins. Put yourself in Ruth's shoes. Put yourself right here. P put yourself. What is he going to say? New land, new God, new people, no certain future. What's he going to say? Listen, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field or leave this one. Keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field. They are reaping and go after them. I Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. <laughs> this is extraordinary generosity. This is abundant generosity. He's urging her, seek out no other field. You've come to the last field you'll ever need, is what he's saying. You've come to the, the last benefactor you'll ever need. I've charged the young men not to touch you. Very important for a foreign woman to have protection from this esteemed and respected, worthy landover. I, 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 don't, don't touch her. You leave her alone. And go after my young women. So I'm giving you a place right along with my own servants. You have a place with them. And, and, and by the way, if you're thirsty, go to the vessels that the, the men have done. This is uh, culturally, th this is not like a gentlemanly kind of culture, okay? So you have to feel the cultural effect here. Normally, foreigners drew water for Israelites. That's the way it normally would work. What Boaz is saying is, not only do, am I not going to have you have to draw water and break up your workday, my men are going to draw water for you, and you are free to come partake and just benefit from what they have done. It is a reversal of what she would have expected. Th this is favor uh, beyond imagination. She wanted to know about favor. This is incredible favor and kindness. Not only does she get to stay in this field, she doesn't have to wander from field to field. She gets to be with the workers. Not only with the workers, she can stay in this field for the entirety of the harvest. Not only that, but if she has thirst, she can go to these vessels that they've drawn for his very own servants and, and, and receive. We, we feel her surprise in verse 10. She fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said, 
Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Shocking surprise is present for Ruth. Shocking surprise. Why? Why have you done this? And Boaz answers her. Two, two reasons, Ruth. I'll give you two reasons. First of all, I believe in a God who will reward your trust and your sacrifice towards him displayed towards Naomi. He will reward your seeking of him. Now, now sometimes because we believe salvation is by grace alone, we're uncomfortable sometimes with the language of reward. But reward is a biblical truth. God will reward those who seek him. N not normally in physical ways like it's portrayed in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, but certainly ultimately physically in the new heavens and new earth and certainly spiritually in our fellowship with him right now. The Lord rewards. There is no investment, no sacrifice, no labor of love that will not be returned a hundredfold. Jesus even said those who leave lands and parents and father and mother, maybe he had Ruth in mind when he said that, will not receive in this life and in the life to come eternal life. Maybe he had Ruth in mind when he said that. So there's a reward. There's also a, a vindication of God reason. You notice that in the end of verse 12. You've come under the wings. This wonderful image of a, a chick coming under its mother's wings. You've come under the wings of Yahweh. And so he's saying Yahweh has vindicated his worthiness as a God of trust. And he will provide for you. He sees himself as an instrument of fulfilling God's honor as a trustworthy God, as a rewarder of those who seek him. He says, through my generosity, I'm just doing what Yahweh would clearly want to do towards you. I am Yahweh's instrument to bring about the vindication of his trustworthiness and the reward of you who have sought him and entrusted yourself to him and reflected his steadfast love in your own. Abundance will... The abundance doesn't stop. It keeps going. Verse 14, uh, it should feel like uh, <laughs> like you can't describe it, what it should feel like. Verse 14 should feel as though this incredible gift and surprise has been lavished on her. And then, wonder of wonder, she hears Boaz's voice. Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed to her roasted grain. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening and then she beat out what she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley. <laughs> Mealtime in that culture was a time of in incredible hospitality. To sit next to the landowner, among his reapers, to, to be passed literally out of his hand food. This was including her in his official family. This was family inclusion. This wasn't just generosity towards a, a foreigner on the, on the field. This was welcoming her to his own household, saying, I, I will provide for you like one of my own. I will give you everything you need. I, I will provide for you out of my own hands I will give to you so that you have more than you could possibly eat. And then he says to the men as she goes back to glean in the afternoon, Look, don't, don't, just, don't just stay away from her. Don't, don't just guard her from harm. I, I want you to actually leave, intentionally leave food for her. No more scraps for, for Ruth. I, I want you to pull out the sheaves and leave them for her. I, I want her to have an abundance. What's he saying? My harvest has become yours. An ephah of barley was somewhere between 30 and 50 pounds. No wonder when she gets home, Naomi is somewhat awestruck. 
She goes out hoping for favor. I, boy, I hope I can, I mean, just maybe here and there they'll drop one and I can get a little bit. She comes home with 30 pounds. 30 pounds? I mean, you have any idea what 30 pounds of barley grain? I mean, just she's carrying it home in the sack and she has leftover food. What are we supposed to see here? Who brought her to that field? Don't forget those two dangers. We've got to feel the human side of it. We're doing that. I want us to feel that. But then we've got to transition to the theological point. Who brought her to that field? Who made sure Boaz saw her? Who knew who, how Boaz would react? Who, who led Boaz to the point that he would want to respond in this way? The author invites us to see it's God. God is doing this. Boaz makes it explicit. God is the one you have come under his wings for refuge. God is the one who will reward you. I'm just an instrument in his hands. But ultimately, God is the one who is lavishing this abundance on you. This is what Yahweh is like, Ruth. Let me tell you what the God is like that you have come to. He's like this. He offers protection. He offers provision. He's given you more than you could ever need. He invites you to his table and fellowship. He ensures you have drink when you need it. He sends you home with more than you could possibly eat. He gives you provision now and into the future. He guarantees that no one will touch you. This is the God you've chosen to believe in. Welcome to Yahweh, Ruth. <coughs> Abundant provision and generosity and fellowship and inclusion. I mean, imagine how shocked it seems as though Ruth could barely stop talking. And not only that, he said I could stay with him for the rest of the season. I don't have to go look for another field. We've been provided for. God has provided for us. Which leads to her story. Her story is when she comes back and she reveals to Naomi what has happened. And her story is defined by Naomi. This is Ruth's story. Naomi takes up pen and writes this biography and reveals to Ruth what has actually been going on. Out of the mouth of Naomi, this is particularly poignant because she was the woman with hard thoughts of God at the end of chapter 1. This provision, this abundance is so profound, so surprising, that even Naomi has her hard heart broken in the face of it. Even Naomi, with her bitter thoughts of God and her angry thoughts of God's providence and her questions of God's goodness, is overwhelmed and begins to cry out in praise, praise the Lord whose Love has not forsaken the living or the dead. You notice in verse 20, it says, whose kindness, that's that same word we talked about last week, his covenant love, his merciful love, his patient love, his enduring love, his relentless love, that word that can't be translated with one English word. That kind of love is what Naomi is saying. God is indeed loving and he has poured out his love because you don't know this, but you just showed up at a field of one man who happens to be one of our redeemers. Naomi has now been transformed by realizing that her hard thoughts of God we're wrong. Her deformed imagination of a God who delighted to punish was wrong. And in Ruth's experience, she sees Yahweh's love. It is good, she says. It's good. It is good that you go out with his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. You'll be protected, Ruth. You'll be provided for. And he's one of our redeemers. You can almost sense a glimmer of not just immediate hope, but the future hope as well. Because a redeemer in that community, in that culture, according to the law, had a responsibility to care for the well-being of the widows and those in need. That was something God had built into the law, that from among the people of Israel, the clan, one of their own brothers, would watch out for those in need. 
That was something God had established. And this is a person who is in that position. He is a redeemer to watch out for and to care for and to have concern for and perhaps even to ensure the longevity of this family line. A glimmer of hope for the future begins to break into Naomi's thinking. One commentator said that when, when Ruth told her about Boaz, the sun rose for Naomi. Could a future be possible? Could it be that life will overcome death? Is it possible that Yahweh could be that loving? Ruth's story, as told here by Naomi, is the story of God's generous love, abundant love beyond imagination, beyond capacity, beyond finding out, beyond searching out, beyond what anyone could possibly have imagined. How do we apply this story to ourselves? How do we apply it to ourselves? Well, I trust that if we're thinking in terms of the Bible storyline, you're already sensing some of the connections. Because Ruth is an outsider who previously was from a culture who followed false gods. She has been brought in to this family of God. Unbeknownst to her, there is a redeemer that God has planned and prepared to meet her right where she is on that journey. And not only to meet her and give her the scraps, but to welcome her to his very table to provide for her every need and to ensure her well-being into the future. This role of redeemer was built into the law. Why? So that God could establish a future pattern and a future plan that would ultimately find fulfillment in another redeemer from Bethlehem. God wrote history forward to backward. Very important to understand that's a biblical truth. God knows the end from the beginning. He writes history from forward to backward. What was God's plan? To redeem people like Ruth and to restore them into relationship with him and to raise up someone from the people of Israel who could lavish his own steadfast love and abundance on those people contrary to all of their expectations, contrary to what they deserved. And so knowing that that was his plan, he wrote that pattern in. In. And the people, the Israelites, reading this would know what's going to happen. And if you read ahead to verse, chapter 4, you know that too. You, you, you know what's going to happen. There's going to be a marriage. There's going to be a child. There's going to be a future. That future is going to bring about redemption and salvation and deliverance and kingship. This story is not even just about Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi. It's about how God is dealing with his wayward and compromising and unworthy people. So at the same time that God's helping Ruth, he's helping everybody else. At the same time he's helping Naomi, he's providing for a million other needy people as well. So in Ruth, we don't just see a, a wonderful story that coincidentally looks a lot like mine in a spiritualized way. No, no, it's much more profound than that. In Ruth... God is revealing his love and loving you. In Ruth, God is revealing how he loves and at the same time laying the groundwork for the Redeemer to come. He's laying the groundwork for the one that would come and would be just like Boaz. We don't look at Boaz and say, well, he reminds me a lot of someone else. We look at Boaz and say, he, he does but I think that was the plan. It's not just that chance chanced upon a man who happens to look like a redeemer I have. We say, no, God created a person in a situation that would reveal the redeemer that I have. And so we look at Boaz and his, his reaction to Ruth, and who do we see? We see our redeemer. We look at his lavish generosity, and everything he says to her, we can translate to our experience. Can't we? Take your hard thoughts of God 
And let the love of your Redeemer revealed in this story through the generosity of Boaz, let them crush those hard thoughts of God. Let them melt that iceberg and lay down that spike of bitterness and break up that hard ground. Take them to the love of Boaz towards Ruth, revealing God's love, ultimately displayed in Jesus Christ, the Redeemer. Who's our Redeemer? Who's the one that was entrusted with our well-being? Who God handed our salvation to? Who took up our cause? Who was responsible to redeem us and protect us and provide for us and to give us what we need and welcome us to his table and provide for us drink that would always satisfy? Who does that sound like? Doesn't it sound like Jesus? Yes, it does. Jesus is the one who gathers every Ruth from a distant country, draws her to himself, says, I will provide every need for you. I will give you everything you need. You can trust me. I will give you beyond what could satisfy you. I will give you every spiritual blessing, and I will lead you to a homeland where you would not imagine the abundance that I have for you. It's Jesus Christ right here in the book of Ruth. Isn't that what Jesus was saying to his followers when he rose from the dead and they said, oh, Jesus died and we don't know what's going to happen now. He said, you slow of heart to believe. And then he explained to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Maybe one of those scriptures was Ruth. And maybe he went to them and said, brothers, let's, let's just take Ruth as an example. Do you really think Boaz was the last and final expression of the love of God towards his people? Do you really have such a, a shorthand view of God? Brothers, brothers, surely this was not the last. Surely this was not the final, the ultimate redeemer. Surely Boaz was just a picture of something greater. Surely God would not leave a million other Ruths unattended to and uncared for. Surely he would raise up someone else. Surely in Boaz you can see what I am doing. Surely, brothers, you see Jesus there at work. You see yourself and Ruth and Naomi. Surely, brothers, you can see this. That out of Israel, God would raise up a redeemer who would call in the, the widows and the orphans spiritually, those who desperately needed someone to care for and provide for them. And you know what's incredible about comparing Boaz to Jesus? It's this. The cost to Boaz was minimal. The generosity was abundant. The cost to Jesus was infinite. And the generosity was profound. Jesus gave to you, if you're a Christian, everything and more that Boaz gave to Ruth. He gave you endless, a harvest field. He said to you, don't, don't go looking in another field. You don't need any other field. You need no other field. Stay here. Stay here. I will provide for you. Jesus says to you and me, come to my table and I will provide for you. I will comfort you. I will take your burden and I will turn it into blessing. I will take your weariness and I will turn it into rest. I will take your thirst and I will turn it into satisfaction. I will take your hunger and I will provide for you spiritually. I will be to your soul everything you need. That's what Jesus says to you and to me if you're a Christian. He says that to us. But he doesn't say that in the way Boaz did, where ultimately Ruth's 30 pounds is not going to make a big dent on his harvest. Because Jesus said it knowing that our need was more than just for food to fill our bellies. It was atonement to pay for our sins. He said it more than just food to last for the harvest. We needed a payment for our rebellion. And so Jesus says, come to me and I will take your sin on me so that you can receive my harvested inheritance. He's even better than Boaz, and Boaz is incredible. Boaz is incredible. It would be as if Boaz said, you get to enjoy the whole field. Go home, eat until you're full, drink, and, and, and be satisfied, and, and don't ever leave the field. And, and there's actually a law that commands that people like you have to be cursed and destroyed and punished, but I'll take that on myself. You enjoy the field. I'll enjoy the punishment. That's what Jesus said to us. Take, protect her, keep her safe. Never let her go to another field. Always make sure she has enough. I'm going to go to her cross and die for her. That's what Jesus says to you. It's what he says to me. 
receive always enough, more than you could possibly eat. And you'll never have to face the punishment for your sins. You'll sit at my table with my servants forever. What are hard thoughts of God next to Ruth chapter 2? What are hard thoughts of God next to our Redeemer on a cross? Next to our Redeemer saying he prepares a place for us. Let's take our hard thoughts of God to those places and let's let them soften and melt. Let's take them there. Let's do that right now. Let's, let's take them there. Take your hard thoughts of God. Maybe, perhaps, you, you question his directions, his ability to give directions. I don't understand that detour, Lord, and I don't understand that detour either, and I don't get why you led me in that direction. Why did you allow that to happen in my life? Why that terrible history? Why that regret? Why that painful suffering? Why, Lord? Let's take those questioning of his directions. Maybe it was as simple as this week, wondering why you were behind, the driver you were behind. Or maybe it was going back to some huge relational breakup and why you happen to know that person that is such a blemish on your record. Maybe it's some painful loss or maybe it's some difficult sin. Let's take those directional questions to Ruth chapter 2 and to the cross where our Redeemer purchased our harvest and let's let them wither. God knows where he's leading you. God directs all of my steps. Maybe you have questions of God's intentions. Well, sure, God's bringing everything about for his glory, but is he really loving? Is he really generous? Is he really kind? Be very clear. Because of what will happen between Ruth and Boaz and the future that will create, God was loving you when he loved Ruth. And if he was loving you 3,000 years ago, he's certainly still loving you today. Maybe you question his worthiness. Verse 1 says that Boaz was a worthy man, an influential man, a noble man man of influence. Maybe you question, is he really worth entrusting myself to my Redeemer? Maybe that's because your eyes are wandering to other fields. Maybe there's a better field. I mean, Jesus is great, but gosh, the fields of fun in this world and self-confidence and other kinds of earthly enjoyment, those fields look pretty good too. Maybe that's where hard thoughts of God come. Just in neglect. Let's let Ruth chapter 2 change our minds. What could be a greater field than the harvest of salvation given us in Jesus Christ? Why would Ruth want to go to any other field? Why would a Christian want to go to any other savior? Why would a Christian seek rest in any other place? Why would we wander away from this kind of abundance? Now we all do and we're drawn and we're tempted and we take a detour and pause and look at different fields of rest and enjoyment and pleasure and satisfaction. But let's keep our eyes here like Boaz instructed Ruth. Let's fix our eyes here. Let's stay here. This field is beyond imagination. Every spiritual blessing provided for us in Christ Jesus in whom we have been made children of God with an eternal inheritance with a deposit of the Holy Spirit in whom our sins have been forgiven, our record cleansed, our future secure, in whom we've been brought into the family of God. We're no longer foreigners and outcasts, hated by God and hating one another. We've been brought into a temple where we will see God's face and rejoice with his angelic warriors before his throne. Let's Turn our eyes back to this field and remember the abundance we have been given in our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. And let's stand with Ruth and say, this is beyond my imagination, but not beyond my worship. And let's do like Ruth and bow down to our Redeemer and declare, worthy are you. For I have found faith.
favor in your eyes. You know what Ruth chapter 2 says to you? It says, rejoice in the generosity of God's love in Christ. Rejoice. Rejoice in the generosity of God's love in Christ. Redemptional church, let me encourage you to do that this week. Rejoice in the generosity of God's love in Christ. Study and recount the abundance in Christ that we have been given. Let's take our hard thoughts of God and let them die at the foot of the cross and at the field of redemption. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we rejoice in your steadfast love, your incredible compassion and generosity. You have crowned our days with overwhelming grace. You, Lord, are so good to us. Receive our gratefulness. Receive our affection, Lord. Take and transform any hard thoughts of you and turn them into worship. Transform them into praise, Lord, I pray. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.